Hey there, beloved saints. I wanted to read something to you. It's an article called The Walls Have Ears, and it's written by Ken Yates. It's in Grace in Focus magazine. It's the magazine put out monthly by Grace Evangelical Society. Uh, I, I disagree with them on uh, a number of minor positions, such as Outer Darkness. However, they are great men of God and great defenders of the true gospel message. And one thing that's happened here that was really, really heartbreaking is children are hearing this Lordship salvation message and therefore have no joy and fear that they're going to go to hell because they're too bad or they don't feel bad enough for their sin or children are hearing this and it's taking away the blessed assurance we're supposed to have in Christ. So I wanted to show you, it's not only people like me that uh, were condemned and knew they were condemned because they had tremendous, you know, lascivious living that was keeping them in bondage. I was kept in bondage because every time I try to quit the heroin, I would, I would throw up and shake and vomit and, you know, uh, uh, sweat. And it was just terrible because people told me I had to repent, quote, of my sins not realizing how deep sin really is, thinking that, oh, my big one was that addiction, right? So uh, what I've learned is that uh, we come to Jesus just as we are. He imputes his righteousness on us. The spirit lives in us the moment we trust him for the promise of eternal life. And we're sealed by the Holy Spirit promise until the day of redemption. And then the Holy Spirit begins a work in us and we can either walk after the spirit uh, or the flesh and suffer consequences either direction. So <clears throat> that has nothing to do with eternal salvation, but some are mixing it up. So I want to read this to you, how heartbreaking it is, uh, because it's also children that are being affected by this false teaching. Now, granted, I believe some of them only wanted to encourage Christians to start acting and living like Christians, but we don't corrupt the gospel. We don't up the standards for being saved because we want Christians to act right. All right. We, we leave the gospel the same. We, we cannot add to it because we don't like how some people are living that proclaim themselves Christian. All right. We don't change the gospel message for that. And that's what's happened. So they'll use words like grace and faith and gift and not of yourselves, but they really don't mean what it's supposed to mean. So let me read this article to you. I'm going to flip this around. Um, let me see if I can flip it here. Can I? Oh, oh my goodness. He's like, Zeusy, please stop. Please stop. Uh, I can't flip it. Hey, 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 stop. Stop. There's there's new people in the hotel, so he's acting up. All right, so I'm going to see if I can just read this to you here. You have to look at my fat head while I'm doing it. All right, it says the walls have ears. The meaning of the phrase is that adults need to be careful what they say. Children not only can hear what adults say, but they're listening. This is true even when we don't think they can hear or understand what we're saying. But children understand more than we realize. Without a doubt, every parent can attest to the truth of this saying. This saying has caused me sadness in great recent days. As the readers of this blog well know, there's an ongoing fight between free grace folks and lordship salvation slash reformed theology folks over the assurance of salvation. For most people, the word, quote, fight is too strong because the lordship salvation side has won the war as far as the majority of evangelical Christians are concerned. The free grace folks are definitely a minority. Uh, what do you say? Narrow is the way, I think. Few be there, find it. The sad result of this situation is that most people attending, even conservative evangelical churches, do not have assurance of their salvation because they're basing it on evidence within themselves. And the evidence is God's promise and the resurrection of Jesus is because he promised it and he can't lie. So it's all based on the work and merit of Christ that we have eternal life. And that is all. 
We're, it's not has anything at all to do with us because you're instantaneous, instantaneously born of God the minute you trust Christ. So it says, most do not have assurance of their salvation. That is the direct result of adopting a lordship salvation view. Lordship teaches that one must have good works to have any measure of assurance. And these good works must continue until the end of one's life in order to keep whatever assurance a person might have. Since nobody knows if he'll continue with a holy lifestyle. That always makes me crack up. So holy. I feel like people that think they're holy. It cracks me up. The holiness required for heaven is a gift of holiness. God setting us apart by the offering of Jesus' body. That's the only thing that makes anybody truly holy. Assurance becomes an impossibility. That's true. Also, how many good works must a person have to feel confident he's eternally saved? It is sad enough that many adults live with this fear and anguish. We all know such people, and it's sad to see. However, the sadness is alleviated somewhat by knowing that these are adults we're talking about, and in many cases, they have been presented with the gospel of grace, but are unwilling to believe it, uh, which means they're what? Unbelievers. Okay. Lordship children learn to doubt. But there's no way to diminish the sadness in this area when it comes to children. I have heard three stories recently that are heartbreaking. One of them made me cry. Like, I was, I'll just read it. You'll see why. A Lordship Salvation missionary told me how his 10-year-old daughter came to him and told him she did not think she would go to heaven and was afraid. The reason why she felt that way is because she didn't like, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sweating so bad. Oh. She did not enjoy going to different churches to raise support, and she didn't like her younger brother like she should. The missionary father had tears in his eyes when he told the story and said that it broke his heart to hear his daughter say these things to him. I read the second story in a Christian magazine. A no this is the one that got me, man. I mean, it don't take much these days with what I'm going through to get me to cry. But anyway, another 10-year-old, this time a boy, was dying of cancer. Mm, 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 the devil is a lie. Whew. His family was very active in the Reformed Church. He told his parents he wanted to be saved. They told him. All right, I'm trying not to get mad at them. They told this dying child he could not be saved because he was not serious enough and did not feel sorry enough for his sins. It was only after he sufficiently demonstrated, so what was he going to do? Feign emotional breakage to be good enough? Ugh. Only when he was serious enough about his sin that they tell him he could pray for eternal salvation. See, he's got to be grieved and broken and all this. Now, there is a place for that. But there is nowhere in Scripture that says you must have an emotional response to anything to be saved. Some people just aren't emotional. They acknowledge they're a sinner. They hear the message of what Christ has done. And they say, yes, please, I need that. Because I am lost without him. And they receive it by faith and are born of God. They go on. There are some that just aren't emotional people. You don't have to have an emotion and break down and feel bad for anything. You know, these are normal Christian responses. But godly sorrow is something saved people have. Okay? It's not something the lost man must achieve in order to be saved, but something a saved person has because the Spirit of God dwells in him. All right? So, godly sorrow that worketh repentance unto salvation not to be repented of is the salvation there is to be saved from temporal judgment, from temporal chastisement or consequence or correction uh, of the church. So, We've got to divide that. That broke my heart. 
says, I became aware of the third story on TikTok. A woman put a video clip up talking about her eight-year-old daughter. She had tears in her eyes as she told how she was the daughter of a pastor. But her daughter came to her and told her she too was afraid because she thought she was going to hell, an eight-year-old. The reason she thought that way is because she just did so many things that were bad. Even though the video did not reveal what kind of church they attended, it's not difficult to hear the echoes of lordship thought. The girl certainly did not arrive at her fears in a vacuum. While crying, her mother made this telling statement, I have let my daughter down. Uh, sweetheart, I'm sorry, but yeah. Yeah. But it's not too late. It's not too late. It's not just actual little children that need the truth of the gospel. If you're looking at you to confirm your salvation, you're looking in the wrong place. Uh, there's a lot of people that reform their life. I mean, you look at a Mormon, they find religion. They stop drinking. What does it say? I don't, don't uh, drink, smoke, chew, or hang with them that do. You know, they uh, change all the outward behavior and are very religious, not saved. So you can't look at that. It says, I realize that many Lordship Salvation folks will see these stories as evidence of God working in the lives of children by showing them the depth of their sin. I see it. the Holy Spirit convicts the unbeliever of sin because they don't believe on Jesus. But he convicts the believer of righteousness, of his right standing because of Christ. So um, the accuser is the one that uh, accuses us day and night before the Lord, not the spirit. So uh, I think they got the they got that mixed up. It says that they're going to think it's the God working in the life. I, I just don't see that. I, I don't see anybody that approached Jesus when he was physically here. That was afraid of him. I saw people come up to him and fall at his feet in tears and wash his feet with their hair. Uh, yeah, because they were so overwhelmed by his love for them that it broke them. Were there people that repented of their lifestyle of sin because they ran into Jesus? Oh, yeah. That, did that save them? No. What saved him is them acknowledging he was the promised son of God who could take away their sin. And then because of that, their heart was changed. See, people got it backwards. All right. It says, surely the parents of the boy dying of cancer felt that way. However, it's interesting that the parents of the other children clearly did not. My guess is that the other two parents felt that their children were just children and were innocent and good. They weren't guilty of really bad sins like adultery or murder. They shouldn't think they weren't good enough to rest in their salvation. I also think they probably thought about how Jesus dealt with children during his ministry. Any child that thought of the Lord with fear because of his or her sin clearly did not understand his love or grace. I mean, the children ran towards him and wanted to embrace him and sit on his lap to the point where the apostles were shooing them away. And he said, no, 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 suffer the little children to come unto me or allow the children to come unto me for such is the kingdom of heaven. See, he says, um, whenever it says suffer, it means to put up with, allow. Suffer the little children to come unto me. It doesn't mean suffer little children suffer. I hate it when people twist it like that. I've heard secular TV shows do that. Um, but it says it's hard to say, but as harsh as it sounds, the parents are at fault here. The mother was right. She had let her daughter down. These children did not come up with these theological ideas on their own. They had heard them from their parents, their pastors, and even pastors they were related to. Perhaps when the adults spoke among themselves and promoted lordship salvation and its lack of assurance, they did not realize their children were listening. What they were saying did not apply to the little ones. If they had thought this through, maybe they would have said something like, but this doesn't apply to you. Jesus loves you more than we do. <laughs> he gives you eternal life as a free gift. When you simply believe in him for it, don't worry about being good enough. That's exactly what everyone should hear 
not just little children. I am not sure how the parents in first and third story will address these issues with their children. These kids are simply believing what they had heard from them. They should be proud of what their, their kids say, but it is gut wrenchings to these parents. They know something is wrong. Do you see? If this was correct, why are they grieved at their children's fear? They would just say, well, you know, that's true. You're supposed to not know. No, they know something's off, man. Because that's not good news. It's not good news. And if it's not good news, it's not the gospel. They know something's wrong, even if they can't put their finger on it. If they are not willing to give up their lordship salvation view of eternal salvation or lack thereof, the lack of assurance, maybe a little advice is in order. When you get together, whether in church, Bible study, or just friendly theological discussions, take extra precautions because the walls have ears. Our kids hear this stuff. And I'll tell you that when, when Jim was seven or eight, he listened, man. He heard things. He learned things. He, he understood the difference between discipleship and service versus the gift of eternal life. And, and when I said to uh, his aunt one time, you know why that's so wicked? Because we we're watching a documentary on these Filipino people uh, crawling on glass on their hands and knees. And then some of them even getting crucified. And I say, you know why that just burns me up? Why that's so wrong and blasphemous? And my son said, because Jesus already did it. <sighs> Out of the mouth of babes, right? He got it. What an insult. How can you think what you're going to suffer is going to impress God after, as Isaiah said, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. For my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquity. That's what pleased God. You know, it just broke my heart to hear that, that I know they mean well, but that was a child dying of cancer. And they told him he couldn't even ask for salvation until he felt bad enough for his sin. What could that child have possibly done? Wow. I just want to show you. Uh, does that, does that really uh, give the fruit of the Spirit? I mean, the fruit of the Spirit is joy, peace, patience. You know, there, there's no real joy. I mean, because if, if we look at ourselves, all of us, we know that God standards perfection, and none of us reach that. So it's either God's righteousness imputed on us by simple faith, or it's our own righteousness. There's not a mixture here, not in regard to salvation. Okay, you guys. God bless.